In the previous lesson, we looked into the structural change in terms of uh, entry and exit and reallocation of resources between firms. And uh, now in this lesson, let's look into a little bit more detail to the, to the share weights S that we required in these uh, decompositions. So um, I return back to this uh, slide that summarizes three alternative decompositions. Uh, we also consider the only Pakes decomposition and also the the Bailey et al. decomposition. So all of these alternative uh, decompositions that try to capture the uh, impacts of structural change, entry and exit and reallocation, they are heavily dependent on these shear weights S. So notice that none of these decompositions could be calculated without those uh, those uh, shear weights. So to get those uh, shear weights, uh, um, uh, in some sense, these previous studies seem to implicitly assume that uh, the researcher has had at hand uh, a complete census data of all firms in the industry, that there are not any, at least not any, any significant groups of firms missing from the data. Another issue that comes to mind is that, uh, that uh, how exactly we calculate this share weight. So obviously they should um, uh, somehow represent the, the um, uh, perhaps a market share of the firm in the industry, but it's not directly evident that what kind of uh, variable should be used for calculating the shares. So for example, should it be uh, the shares of total revenue of the industry in some sense turnover shares, or should it be rather value added? or perhaps some other measure of, uh, of uh, share weights. So in my impression, this is to some extent remains unaddressed. Uh, in, in some stream of studies that, uh, that look at the, for example, labor productivity. So it's quite natural then to use the employment share of the company as, as the share weight. But when we go to total, pro pro total factor productivity, it's not immediately obvious how to calculate these shares even. And I want to also connect to this um, other stream of, stream of literature that looks at the aggregation of firm level uh, productivity and efficiency indices to the industry level. And there are some, some important studies like, uh, like Blackerby and Russell point out that uh, in general, there is no consistent aggregation of firm level, uh, firm level efficiency scores to the industry level. And same applies to the productivity measures, obviously. Uh, there are more optimistic studies like uh, like Fair and Zeleniuk, uh, who who show that um, if you look at the if you look at the the more, more kind of monetary revenue efficiencies and and uh, or cost efficiency, then this kind of monetary measures could be aggregated, uh, and they also then then in terms of revenue efficiency, then it would be revenue shares that would be would be appropriate, and uh, Valentin Zeleniuk has. Uh, uh, continued further in this line, so he has also extended to the to the productivity indices like Malmquist. So at this point, I just mainly mainly point out that uh, it's not always uh, self evident that the, that we can have this uh, uh, equation that Oli and Pakes just take as self evident that the firm level uh, firm level productivity can be aggregated by using share weights to industry level. So if this if there is not this kind of consistent aggregation then this equation would fail immediately. So, so that would be in some sense the first step to make sure that these uh, productivity measures are such that uh, can be aggregated from firm level to the industry level. And that would be obviously also then indicating that uh, which weights to use, are there revenue shares or, or whatever. I believe value added shares are not really necessarily good ones in, in uh, uh, aggregating from firm level to the industry level because there are value added is a difference and it can be also negative for some firms. So then another issue with the share weights related more for the first point that okay if you don't have the the complete census data so sometimes these uh, decomposition approaches are also used for sample data. But uh, what if we have a sample of firms, for example, coming from a rotating sample, rotating panel design, where some, some of the firms are, are maintained in the sample, and some, some uh, a sampling wave of new firms is, uh, is coming to the sample regularly. And then also there is like a 
due to the sample design, some firms are left out of the sample. So in that kind of uh, setting, for example, in, in rotating panel design, uh, then entry of firm to the sample does not necessarily mean that it's, it's a, a new firm to the market. It can be that it was uh, already existing before, it was just not uh, included in the sample yet, or it randomly was not sampled to, to, the, to the data set before. And similarly, exit from the sample does not necessarily mean that this uh, uh, firm ceased to exist or firm uh, uh, closed its operations. Uh, it can be just that it was uh, left out of the sample, or it randomly was not included in the sample, <clears throat> or it could be also just some kind of sample uh, non-response, so the firm managers did not find time to respond to the survey. So there could be, of course, also this kind of like uh, um, survey non-response bias that, that, that perhaps certain types of uh, firms are more likely to respond to the survey than, than some other firms. And that can favor either, either highly, highly productive firms or low productive firms, depending on the survey design. So in some settings, if, if we have this kind of random survey data, and uh, if also if we have, so for example, the sampling weights are known, it might be that this uh, sampling weights are equal to all firms, or if it is like, uh, like just, uh, just simple random sampling, but there might be also some kind of uh, stratified sampling. So if the sampling weights are known, and the sampling weights are of course different from these market shares, okay? So typically they are they are they are negatively correlated with the with the market shares because with the with the sampling weights we we don't want to want to uh, we want to have a representative sampling so so they are something different from the market shares but it's more like related to the sampling design so in any case if we have some sample data and we can estimate the average productivity in these subgroups of survivors and entering firms and exiting firms then it's possible to then uh, do a similar decomposition but without share weights. So let me first illustrate the idea with some examples. So recall this uh, suggested decomposition by Melitz and Polanek, for example. So, so remember that um, the industry level uh, difference in the productivity was, uh, was attributed to the difference in the productivity of survivors, and then they had an impact of entry and impact of exit. And for clarity, I have here uh, used this color code. So, so entry was the red color and exit was the blue color. And notice that this, particularly here, these components of entry and exit uh, depend on the share weight. So in my view, that's one of the appealing features of this uh, Melitz and Polanek decomposition, that uh, we only need the share weights of the entering firms and exiting firms. However, if it is only enough to consider the net contribution of entry and exit, so if we do not care that is it really entry or exit, but only the, only the net contribution of structural change, then notice that this uh, sum of the red component and blue component, so the sum of the entering firms and exiting firms contributions can be simply obtained as the difference of the industry productivity and that of the surviving firms. So therefore we can, we can estimate this contribution of entry and exit simply as the residual. And this wouldn't require any, any information about the share weight. So if the, if the components on the right hand side of the lower equation, these black components, if we can compute those, then we also can get this uh, sum of the red and blue components without any share weights. Same applies also to the Olean Pakis components. So so, for example, recall this uh, decomposition of Oli and Pakis as the industry productivity as the sum of the average productivity of firms and the reallocation effect. And here, of course, the reallocation effect uh, critically depends on the share weights. However, if we just reorganize this equation so that we move this reallocation component on the left-hand side, we see that this, it is equal to the difference of the, of the industry productivity and the average productivity of the firms. So therefore, we can also calculate this uh, reallocation effect of Oli and Pakis without any share weights. We can take it just the difference. 
finally, before putting these things together, I also noticed this uh, this uh, uh, study of, of uh, Bernard Redding and Scott that I referred earlier, which uh, which uh, draw attention to this multi-product firm. So so I mentioned that study in the, in theme number six, where we considered multiple outputs. So in that study, the authors also note that the product switch is uh, relatively common among these multi-product firms. So it's common that uh, that um, uh, over time these multi-product firms uh, enter new product lines or, or or leave some some production lines. And perhaps uh, uh, two very famous examples that come to mind are, for example, when Apple introduced iPhone. So previously, Apple was of course a, a very successful computer company. But then by iPhone, it entered the uh, mobile phone market where it didn't operate before. And uh, that was very, very successful entry indeed. And as a result, then uh, the world's largest mobile phone manufacturer, Nokia, uh, eventually after, after just a couple of years, after, after introduction of iPhone, then, then uh, Nokia decided to sell its mobile phone operations to, to Microsoft and exit the market. So I think these examples of Apple and Nokia very aptly illustrate this idea that the entry to market uh, does not necessarily mean that it's some, some new startup. It can be a, an, a very large uh, multi-product firm that just enters a new, new, new sector, or new industry. And exit also doesn't necessarily mean that the firm goes bankrupt, like in case of Nokia. So obviously Nokia was in, in serious troubles when it sold its mobile phones, but uh, Nokia still continues to exist uh, as, a, as this uh, networks uh, manufacturer and in, in some other, other sectors. So Nokia didn't go bankrupt after, after it sold its mobile phones. So this, this kind of uh, entry and exit can also occur with the, with the large existing uh, multinational companies. So motivated by this observation, then, then uh, in the following uh, decomposition, we also propose to introduce so-called product switch effect. And uh, we do this in a similar way as, as this, this entry and exit has been uh, considered. Uh, so we simply break down this uh, group of surviving firms to, to, to group that uh, subgroup of, uh, of firms that have switched products and, and another group that has not switched. So, so this SN refers to the to the group of surviving firms that uh, maintain their 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 mix of of uh, products. I think this becomes more evident when when um, when I illustrate you an empirical example. But uh, but so far this product switch effect we can simply then take as also as a residual. So it's we define it as the difference in the average productivity of all surviving firms versus those, uh, those uh, uh, subgroup of surviving firms that uh, did not switch products. So with these uh, three motivating examples, then I introduced the following kind of uh, decomposition. And, uh, and uh, this is proposed in this uh, recent paper with, uh, with uh, Natalia Korsmanen, and uh, I will include this paper also in the, in the reading materials of the, of the, of the course. So, this decomposition is firstly expressed in terms of levels. So, so like in Olian Pakistan, industry level productivity, we can break it down as the components of, uh, of uh, average productivity of surviving firms. And now we, we take it as the, as the group of uh, surviving non-switching firms. So then this product switch effect, if we add it to this, uh, to this average productivity, then uh, this uh, difference between this, this uh, all survivors and, and non-switching survivors then uh, captures this product switch effect. So if we add these two things up, then, then we have this uh, average productivity of survivors like in this Oli and Pakis uh, decomposition. So the entry and exit effect is then the difference between the, the average productivity of all firms versus average productivity of the surviving firms. So that captures the the net effect of entry and exit, but with this, uh, this approach, we cannot distinguish between what is the impact of entry and what is the impact of exit. That would require the share weights. And then finally, 
there is this reallocation effect, which is simply the the residual, like like in we, we, I emphasized in this case of Oli and Pakes. So this reallocation effect is this traditional Oli Pakes uh, reallocation effect, and this residual then, when we already control for the entry and exit and product switch, then this reallocation effect uh, measures the the reallocation of resources uh, across the uh, surviving firms. And notice that, that, that this way of breaking down the, the uh, components of structural change now doesn't require any, any explicit share weights. So we just need to operate with this, uh, these uh, unweighted averages of, of various subgroups of firms. So, so that also then, uh, in uh, our view, is more applicable to, for example, to a sampling data that is not the complete census, but for example, a rotating sample. Another advantage, in my view, of this 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 uh, decomposition that, unlike this uh, Melitz and Polanek decomposition, we can also break it down using using changes in percentage terms. So I have illustrated in this formula. So similar to this uh, uh, index number decompositions of uh, Fisher index, for example, or the Malmquist index, if we take the ratio of um, of uh, industry productivity in period T divided by an industry productivity in period T minus one. So, so we can also make the same kind of decomposition with the ratios. So this allows us to, to operate with the percentage changes in a natural way. And notice also that each of these four components that, uh, that we suggested, it can be broken down in this kind of relative changes rather than absolute changes. So I believe that is a nice future of the of the of the proposed uh, decomposition. So this uh, suggestion of of Melich and Polanek doesn't immediately uh, have this kind of interpretation. I do not want to say that it's not possible to to extend this kind of um, uh, decompositions based on share weights to have percentage changes, but at least uh, it's not so immediately obvious as in the case of the of our, our residual based decomposition. And uh, ultimately, of course, uh, uh, the use of the residual, I believe it's, it's very much in, in line with the Solos idea to, to measure productivity as a residual. So if the productivity as a whole is, is, a, is a residual, it's this unexplained part of, a, of a economic growth, then uh, it should be perfectly valid also to uh, measure this individual subcomponents of the structural change also as a residual. And as I indicated with these equations, uh, these, uh, these residuals are actually completely equivalent to those, those corresponding components that require the, the sampling or this, or this uh, market share weights. So we have ma successfully avoided the, the use of these, uh, uh, of these uh, share weights completely. And this can be particularly useful in data when, when this uh, uh, census data doesn't cover all of the all of the firms in the industry, or if we use some some uh, randomly sampled data, so I will illustrate then the the decomposition with an uh, empirical ap application shortly, and uh, and uh, this uh, application focuses on the structural change in in Finnish agriculture, and. Uh, this might seem kind of like a, like a, uh, somewhat uh, str strange application for the business school students, but uh, uh, but I want to want to advertise that this uh, structural change in agriculture is actually a very fascinating topic because uh, there has been a lot of lot of uh, particularly exit in the in that industry and how to how to uh, measure productivity growth in the sector where almost half of the firms have have left the industry over the past uh, 20 years that's uh, quite quite a fascinating topic <laughs>